Chiron is a three times author, digital artist, host of the Rich Conversations podcast, and founder of the Quantum School. He was raised on a family farm in Raymond, Wisconsin, and lives in Chicago. He fuses both his rural and urban backgrounds to draw inspiration. After a near death experience in 2018, he's been in pursuit of curiosity, leading to a life filled with infinite possibilities. Rich is an avid museum goer, dinosaur enthusiast, and Bucks fan. Please welcome Rich. All right, thank you. When I say time is short, you say love is real. Time is short. 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 Love is real. real. Beautiful. Now, the reason I know this is because I've had actually two near-death experiences in the last five years. You had mentioned uh, the first one. The most recent one was less than a year ago. So I have a podcast called Rich Conversations, and I talk to people all over the world in all different fields. So I was scheduled to record with my friend Kat. She works at Mission Control at NASA. And we both have a fascination with dinosaurs, and we love Jurassic Park and this whole series. So I'm about to record with her the next day, so I thought, you know, in preparation, I'm going to go see Jurassic World again. So I'm heading to the movie theater. It's like 10.30 at night, walking down the street, and then an SUV pulls up, doors fly open, and three guys with Uzi guns run at me and demand I give them everything I have. So here I am with three big guns pointed at my face, and I see these bright blue dots on each of them, and I said no. So then we have this back and forth. They're threatening to shoot me. I'm refusing to give up my stuff. So then one of them hits me in the back of the head with a gun. The other one hits me in the face. They take off my backpack. Eventually they want my phone and wallet. There's a back and forth. I gave it to them. Then they wanted the passcode, and I said no. So then, <laughs> I, I would not advise uh, saying no when you have three guns pointed at your face. <laughs> For future reference, don't do that. But they threatened to shoot at my feet if I didn't give them a passcode. So I waited, and they didn't shoot. So at that point, I'm like, they're not going to shoot me, and then I ran. But the reason I said no, so they got a MacBook Pro, an iPad, iPhone 7, iPhone 8, and an iPhone 13 mini. And that, I have a podcast, I have a production company, and I happen to have my backpack at the time, but it wasn't those things that I cared about. It was notebooks. I had like three different notebooks, and I spend, what we're going to do today is kind of what I do. I just, I like to think and write. Think about life. Think about my own life. Think about the world and write and then envision how I'm going to realize the things that I want to happen. So I, after that experience, I kind of improved my file organization system. So all the electronics are all backed up. But now I started to take physical things, take photos of them and organize them in folders. So if that happens again, I don't have to say no, right? But before this point, you had mentioned I had another near-death experience. So that was four years prior to this, where I jumped from a burning tractor on the family farm. And ever since then, I was like, how do I live my best life? You know, there's all this confusion. How do I do it? So I just decided to follow my curiosity. So I signed up for a membership at the Art Institute of Chicago. And since then, I've gone over 200 times. I would just start reading. I was never really a a reader. But I would just like read what I'm interested in. And it just led to this kind of journey that's been really fun. But one of those things that I came across was Sacred Hoops by Phil Jackson. Now, he's the coach of... Chicago Bulls, Los Angeles Lakers, led them to 11 titles together. 
And this book outlined the philosophy that he used and instilled in the team to win all of that. And to me, it was like, the results are clear. If Michael and Kobe could do this, like I'm gonna do it. So then I started doing it in my life. And what Phil's philosophy was, is that five individuals thinking as one can defeat five individuals thinking for themselves, for five individuals. So what he would bring in to practice and introduce to the team is mindfulness and meditation. So he would have guys just sit in silence and breathe and it clears out the mind. So a lot of times in basketball, as a reference, people are thinking about, oh, the last shot they missed or what's going on on the court or like how many points they're gonna score, stats and all these different things. What he would actually teach his team to do is just be aware, awareness. So, and this goes in life too. We, we have so many things in our mind and then we have technology that just bombards us with information, overstimulation, all these different things that stimulate and trigger emotions and feelings inside of us. So what I practice is just clearing that out. So you can be as fully present as possible and aware of what's happening around you. So in basketball, the teams, all they have to do is just react to what is happening. You don't even need to run plays. Now in life, people often want to impose their self on other people to show, this goes back to the ego, right? So Phil would want to reduce the ego and understand that we all are on the same team, we have the same ultimate goal, and it's a journey to get there. We all have roles, some are big, some are small, but each is important and every person needs to feel empowered in that, that what they are doing serves the purpose and fulfills this higher kind of calling. So sometimes during games, before this in practice, he would have people visualize their safe place. So just close your eyes and go to a place in your life or childhood that just brings you calmness and peace. So instead of going over plays, you call a timeout and just have these grown men playing sports just go to their, their safe place. And then they come out a lot focused and energized, right? So I've applied that to my own life and have done it every single day for four years prior to this gunman encounter. So when the gunman encounter happened, my life individually had been pretty great and had been what I've kind of envisioned and live a life that I've designed, but there's kind of this suffering because perhaps I'm not sharing enough with others with this. And this event is more of a reflection on society rather than anything else. It's not anger at the individuals who did it. It's just ignorance and environment. We're all products of our environment. So how do we create kind of a better society, a better world. So I started the quantum school and um, I'm kind of releasing it now. You can uh, go to quantumschool.io. I'll talk more about it, but we're gonna do a lot of the same things today that I wanna teach in this organization. And it's creating, say we're all boats on the water, right? What we wanna do in our communities is raise the tide so that all boats rise. We want everybody to experience a better world where they're able to be fulfilled and live their dreams. But we're also all interconnected and everything we do individually affects others, right? The world does not center around us individually. We have to think about how we interact with everybody, how that's gonna impact other people. So what we're gonna do today is kind of start off with that and kind of give you some exercises for you to do individually and lead you more in this direction of awareness and understanding yourself 
so you can better impact your community and raise the tide, all right? Um, so something we're gonna do is close our eyes and take deep breaths, <clears throat> just breathe. And I'm gonna set a timer for two minutes. Starting now. Close your eyes and just breathe. How do you guys feel? Tired. Sleep relaxed. Tired, relaxed, sleepy, calm. Was that easy or was that hard? First 15 seconds is like minutes. Okay. Do you guys do this often? Do you guys ever do this? Some do. Okay, some do. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting how something so simple, something so basic to being a human being, just breathing, just sitting in silence, is so calming, so nourishing in a way? Do you guys think most people do this? No. no. Something so basic to human existence, and yet we don't. Because I would guess, too, that most in society are constantly overstimulated, distracted, bombarded with information and that evoke or provoke all these different feelings and sensations. But it wasn't always like this, right? You didn't always have access to every single song ever recorded on your phone that you could play at any moment of time, wherever you are in the world, right? The world was pretty silent. And it's almost like we have to go out of our way to get back to that basic thing as humans that we do. Today, we're going to do kind of a, to piggyback off of that exercise, we're just gonna think about our lives and answer questions. Something again, very simple. So the first question I have is really my favorite. What are you curious about? 
So I want you to write down, what are you curious about? This is my favorite question. I ask it on the podcast. It's my last question I ask everybody. You get a lot of surprising answers. Rich conversations. I'll write it up here. Yeah, next week I have uh, I'm releasing an episode with my friend Shelby. She's a marine biologist in Florida. Impressive human being. And she builds artificial coral reef systems to help uh, mitigate damage done to Florida coastlines. So she'll, and she uses art as a way to engage communities. And so we talked about, we recorded on Earth Day actually, and I was in Miami. So we recorded this like on the beach and um, talked about Earth Day and the reef systems in Florida, you know, things going on with climate change, but also just like personally, just chatting about life. Organization. <laughs> now, bio, I love talking to biologists because, um, and people that understand nature, that deal with nature, ecosystems, our, our bodies are an ecosystem itself, and everything is dependent on everything else. In nature, in ecosystems, everything is dependent on each other. The insects, the animals, the plants, cities, everything is interconnected and reflects ecosystems of nature. And so when we want to improve our communities, we need to have that understanding. It's not about me. It's about all of us. And what is my role? What can I do to make this better for others, more smoother for everyone, right? Yeah, we're releasing a video, uh, an episode two with my friend. He's a pianist, composer, and he has a residency in Florence this month. How many episodes do you have? Uh, it'll be 280 next week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Spotify, YouTube. Spotify, YouTube. I transferred, I had a, uh, an individual YouTube, and then I've been finding that I need to break it up. Because I'd have people your age subscribing because I'm doing like Harry Styles videos, but also like 50 year old men because I also bartend at a Bills bar and so it gets pretty rowdy during Bills games. So I have all these different demographics, I need to split it up, so I created a new one for the podcast and the clips from the podcast. Uh, where are you again now? I live in Chicago right now. But I like to be mobile, you know, like in March, I hung out in Mexico City for a week. And I was in Miami for a week in April. Next week, I'm, or next month, I'll be in New York for a week. What was your first job? Define job. Well, like, I don't know, like, that, like, you were getting paid not by your parents, maybe? Well, I guess that, well, I don't know. What was the first thing that you did to, for a source of income? I was an Uber driver. I was an Uber driver from 2014 to 2017. This was the pioneer days of uh, Uber driving. I haven't mentioned, but after college, I voluntarily lived homeless in Chicago to better understand the subject and who it affects. And I've written three books. I'll pass these around. Um, so one is a memoir. Uh, so I did it for four months to just gain this better understanding of the subject, who it, who it affects, what is it like, what goes through someone's mind. Um, and so that book is about two months in particular in a shelter and my friends and their lives and the stories, things that we went through together. 
the biggest thing I learned from living homeless is that you don't need much. You can have a backpack of belongings and have friends or people you love and you're fine. You can be happy. That's it. That's all you need. But constantly we're bombarded to buy things, to, to feel like we need other things that we actually don't. But I've lived uh, since that, especially, and just growing up too, on a farm, like I only need what I need. So my dream has been since like 2012 to live a life where I only need my mind and a computer. That's it. Or a phone or whatever. So everything I've done has been more entrepreneurial, creative, and failing, trying, failing, figuring that out. Um, I've never worked corporate. I have saw that wasn't for me, and I'm going to go this way. Because my life, I want to live a life that brings me fulfillment, and I'm going to design it. And I'm very fortunate. We're all fortunate. We live in a time that we have technology to do that. This phone right here has more technology than what NASA had to get us to the moon in 1969. So I have five of them, and I have a production company. One of my phones is actually in California right now because... Uh, my friends, had a, they played a sold-out tour on the West Coast, and I was like, hey, take this and then record your shows. So I've been like editing their shows. Um, and it's just amazing what you can do with your mind and the technology we have. But all of this goes back to what we were doing. For the last four or five years, every single day, I do this. I have a process, I have a philosophy I live by, and I see results. So that motivates me to keep doing it. And doing what I want to do. It's what, the more time you spend thinking about your own life, what you actually want, and then taking actions and steps towards those, like, that's, that's how you do it. And most people don't do these things. Instead of confronting things that are going on in life and working through them, they lean towards distractions or things that are easy. This stuff is pretty hard. And to do it every single day, it takes a lot of discipline. But you can get results if you do it like that. Um, Let's get back to a moment with the writing. And I want you to think about the question, what am I grateful for? Take some time, write about what you're grateful for. If ever you're feeling down or the world isn't fair to you or treating you right or no one understands you, just like, just go back to gratitude. You know, think about what you have and not what you don't have. I go back to this one a lot. I'm really grateful for indoor plumbing. <laughs> Love it. But it's pretty new. It's like less than 150 years old. That's pretty remarkable. There's so many things to be grateful for, infinite. You know, just, just kind of... Uh, Center yourself that way. And so part of this organization I started called the Quantum School, I want to kind of do what we're doing here. Make it more collective and help people take these steps that I know are hard to do individually and do them together. So I, I do have a sign up here at the end with just name and email. And then I'll, I'll give you a, a self-reflection guide in a PDF form, you can work on your own. There are different questions than what we're doing today. Uh, 50 audio files of meditations that I do every single day. There's, so it's like 50 days and I just repeat it again. Just go back and back and back. 10 minutes. Um, 
It's what I've done the last four or five years. And then also kind of like a, a questionnaire. And uh, I can share those with you guys. The future is about collaboration. And so we need to figure out in all of our separate communities how we work together, right? How, how do we better understand and interact in the world together, understanding we're all a part of it. And we all have different skill sets and personalities that, that we can help each other, right? Because again, time is short, love is real. And when you understand time is short, love is real, you just like, you live life differently. You live kind of on your own terms. And less angry. There's really no need to be angry because most of it is just problem solving. Anybody know what a quantum computer is? How would you describe it? Um, well, it's kind of hard to describe, but it yeah, like, <laughs> uses you know, quantum physics of the like, quantum superposition to like, basically just have multiple different states at once of the particles to store information. So after doing these things for like four years, there was a moment where I just, I was crossing the street and I had this like epiphany that I was just like a different version of myself. By the time I got to the other side of the street, I was like, what just happened? And it kind of felt like this moment of teleportation, but I didn't know how to uh, explain it or comprehend it. So I started, as, I started getting physicists on my podcast and just like, like asking them and then studying physics on my own. And it led me to quantum theory. And quantum theory to me means that anything is possible, but not equally likely. And that's exciting to me because we can apply that in life too, where anything we imagine we can create, we can realize it. It doesn't mean it's likely to happen, but we can do things to make them more likely, to increase the probability. And the way I view now, our minds are much like computers, information processors. We're always sensing things and kind of going through steps to understand what they are and then to organize them. So. By doing these things, reflecting, thinking about life, taking what is the right action. My, uh, my friend in Munich, so I would talk to like, physicists around the world, like uh, Istanbul, Munich, Manila, Paris, and my friend in Munich said, a quantum computer, no, a regular computer can solve a complex math problem in 300 years. A quantum computer can solve it in five minutes. And this technology we can apply to anything across the board to solve problems. That's what the 21st century is. It's just solving problems. But individually, when your mind, after all this training and continually continuing it to train, your mind can kind of operate on like a quantum level. That's why I called it the quantum school. You can, all life is, problems come up all the time. All you gotta do is just solve them. That's what you do. So instead of getting so emotional and attaching all these other meanings, just like, just solve problems. So we'll go back to the reflections. What are three skills you have? You can also think of it in terms of what are you good at? You might not think what you're good at is a skill because it comes so natural to you. But trust me, not everybody
can th- not everybody can do things that you can do. Three skills that you have. Something I think a lot about, I'm obsessed with, is the information revolution. This is a curiosity of mine. It's one of the most pivotal things in human history since the printing press. And what that is, in the 20th century, humans were able to take information and measure them and have implemented it with machines, and machines can then um, calculate information and all that jazz. And it's led to this proliferation of technology and, and information to the point where, you know, as we live today, we know how it is with what our phones can do and social media and the world, right? And technology. The key is us figuring that out in the 21st century. How do we move forward with it? Because there's a lot of fear, especially among older generations. Our role as young generations in America is to update the institutions to reflect this, to reflect the technology in a way. Transition analog to digital and create a greater world using these technologies. So why don't, why don't we think about what is your relationship with technology? Let's write about that. What is my relationship with technology? The stuff we're doing right now is not sexy. You sit in silence and you breathe. You sit down and you write about your life. You think about the world. But taking this time to take a step back, to think about things that are happening, elevates your cognitive skills. So your cognitive skills is your brain power. To look at things objectively, to make decisions. In this century, the two most important skills to have is communication and cognitive skills. What you don't need is information being shoved down your throat. You can just look it up on your phone. But you have to be able to figure out how to use information, how to use tools, how to use your brain power to do certain things. You want your cognitive skills to just go through the roof. So how do you use technology? If you don't, and then think about how you want to use technology. What's your strategy? 
because there are billion dollar algorithms coming for your attention. If you don't have like some sort of plan or strategy, good luck beating those billion dollar algorithms. You got to take charge of your own life in a way, develop a plan that is going to work for you and what you want to do. Make it easy on yourself, right? Like something I do on my phone, I just have, I'm on iPhone. Who's on iOS? Okay, decent amount. Um, I don't know specifically with Android how it's set up, but for me, I just have one page. And uh, I basically put all my social media away in one folder, except Instagram, I use Instagram a lot. But I just have like one page and then I, I like, have a rule that I don't scroll. So on social media, I don't scroll. I basically just use it to send messages and post. That's about it. That's how I use it most of the time. Because you can get sucked in every now and then. <laughs> but that's being human, right? Again, we're up against billion dollar algorithms that understand human biology and psychology and can hack it. It's an interesting world we live in. All right, next question. Let's go. What makes you feel alive? For me, something that makes me feel alive is when I record conversations with people in other countries, other continents, and just meet fantastic people, right? Using technology and our capabilities to kind of explore your curiosity in a way. We're like, I'm friends with someone in Dubai who's from Nepal and at age 10, he was going to the dump and finding electronic parts. He built himself a remote control car, DSLR camera, a calculator, a computer. And then he taught himself cyber skills. So then he learned how to hack and get all these programs, the software. So then he used those skills to then land a job in Dubai. And he uh, wants to work in AI and robotics and... Um, it's just amazing, amazing. It's crazy. Talk to every, every continent except Australia. I got to do Australia. You in Antarctica? Yeah, marine biologist. <coughs> Lived in Antarctica oh, yeah. three months out of the year. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Did you go to Antarctica or did they come to um, you? So this was on Zoom. Oh. But I would like to go to Antarctica. <laughs> There's this like international station and there's no money in the station. So you're like bartering stuff. And so, you know, you, there's this like this international treaty, I think in like 1952, where there's no war on Antarctica. So it's just like the space where Russians and Chinese and Americans and he's Argentinian, Argentinians, like everybody's just like working together in the name of science and the, uh, stuff here it's cool it's a cool cool world uh, another question what's something you're looking forward to in the next six weeks the way my mind kind of works is I, I like to have something that I'm looking forward to, kind of like a finish line that I can sprint towards. Full throttle and then idle. I found in myself that I, I'm not too ambitious or productive in the sense of my goals if I don't kind of have something to work towards in a way. Something where I know there's like, there's a break here. 
So what's something you're looking forward to in the next six weeks that excites you? How much time do you spend on yourself? Do you give yourself? What I mean by that is how often do you set aside time during your day for yourself to think about your own life? One of kind of the the dangers in life, because again, time is short, is to just kind of go through the motions and not check in with yourself. Now, something I do every day is, is this kind of stuff, but I often see people just doing what they think they're supposed to do, but they don't ask themselves, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? And then Time is running. Time is running. And the more time that runs, the less time you have to design and create the life you want to be living. So it's an important question. Important thing to do is to set time for yourself. And I don't mean like, I don't know, taking a bath with Epsom salt and candles and incense like I do and have fun with I mean like actually like sitting down and like thinking about life not just relaxing in a way that stuff is good too but like um, a really good friend of mine helped me better understand the concept of speed versus velocity so with speed you can go fast but if you're not intentional You're going fast in circles. And you're going to burn yourself out, wear yourself out, and you're done, right? We want to think more about living with velocity. And so that's speed in a direction. What we want to do is is take the time, take a step back, think about who we are, where we want to go, what we want to do, the type of life and impact we want to have, and then shoot that way with speed, right? Uh, He's heavily involved in like startup communities and technology and he he sees a lot of like founders, they just wanna go fast, break things, disrupt, right? But then they hit a point and they're kinda done. You know, they're just going fast in circles. Velocity. Let's think about um, what's a moment that made you proud of yourself? This next question is gonna be a little unconventional. What do you hate? Write down what you hate. And then ask yourself why. Sometimes uh, the things we hate give us direction in a way or just better understanding we shouldn't hate anything necessarily but there are things in life that really kind of bother us or maybe we attach ourselves to them these ideas Something uh, I've hated, among things, is social media. But 
I've realized that marketing can help me. And it's only my ideas and perceptions of this thing that are holding me back. So oftentimes we can identify what, what, what is bothering me right now? Okay, it's right here in front of me. Now why? Why do I feel this way? What is it, oh, what in my mind am I, how am I looking at it with my mind that is causing this? Because in of itself, it's not a bad thing, a good thing, it's just, it's neither, it's just like a thing. But it's our attachment to these things and our perception of them. Another one of the things I've hated recently, I've had to identify as uh, French culture. <laughs> it's a weird one. But I've had like interesting interactions with French people. Uh, <laughs> and it's like the culture is like the opposite of American culture. What I love about American culture is that we're all about like new innovation, work hard, go after your dreams, right? Paris, like I went to Paris in January, 2020. And what I'm trying to do is finish one of my books. So I want to go to cafes. I want to drink coffee the entire day. Um, so I go to these cafes, there's no outlets. There's like no space. And then all these places shut down at 3 PM and then they just start drinking wine and smoking cigarettes. And I'm like, what the heck, you know? And then like a month later, I'm in New York and I'm at a coffee shop up until like midnight. And I'm like, yes. But it's like understanding where they're coming from and how they live and how, you know? So I'm trying to like lean more into it. I'm reading uh, Louis XIV biography right now. But oftentimes what we hate, we can learn from. So I think that's something to consider. Let's do one last question. What's your favorite band? <laughs> you can tell a lot about a person and yourself by identifying your favorite music. And you can better understand other people in the music because of the music they listen to. And it's quite interesting. Something I like to do for fun is go to shows in Chicago, just different types of music, and observe the crowd. What are they wearing? What do they look like? What do you like? All these different variables it says something. Music is so intertwined with the human experience that we often kind of identify with the performers and the sounds. So I think that's interesting. So we'll uh, wrap up here and Time is short, love is real. So when I say time is short, you say love is real. Time is short. 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 Love is real. Beautiful. And take the time to live it. Understand it and live it. Take these small steps.